chain of events, cause and effect. We analyze what went right and what went wrong as we discover that many outcomes can be predicted, planned for, and even prevented. I'm John Chigi, and this is Causality. This episode of Causality is brought to you by Aqualia, Solver. Solver is an amazing calculation app that works the way your mind does when you're working out a maths problem on paper. More powerful than a calculator, simpler and quicker than a spreadsheet, Solver can help you solve your math problem. Visit solver.app and check it out today. This episode is also brought to you by ManyTrix, makers of helpful apps for the Mac. Visit ManyTrix, or one word, dot com slash pragmatic for more information about their amazingly useful apps. We'll talk more about both of our sponsors during the show. Causality is also supported by you, our listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can by supporting our sponsors or by becoming a patron. Patrons have access to early release, high quality ad free episodes, as well as other bonus material. You can do this via Patreon. Just visit engineer.network slash causality to learn how you can help this show to continue to be made. Thank you. Variola, Birmingham. This story begins, as sometimes they do, with someone that didn't feel very well one day. On Friday, the 11th of August, 1978, Janet Parker, a medical photographer that worked in the anatomy department of the Birmingham Medical School, began to feel unwell. Within a few days, she broke out in a large number of red spots on her face, her limbs, and her back. On the 20th of August, showing no improvement and now unable to stand without assistance, Janet Parker was admitted to the Catherine de Barnes Hospital in Solihull in the United Kingdom. Test samples taken from Mrs. Parker showed brick-shaped particles under the microscope. Professor Henry Bedson, a 49-year-old international medical expert who also headed the smallpox laboratory at Birmingham Medical School, was called in to consult on the results of the hospital's diagnosis of variola virus. Professor Bedson was one of a very small number of global experts, the World Health Organization, or WHO, that had been commissioned to research the variola virus. Within a week of admission to hospital, Mrs. Parker had developed pneumonia and was no longer able to communicate verbally. Mrs. Parker's father, who had been placed in quarantine with her family, died of an apparent cardiac arrest aged 77 on the 5th of September, although this could not be determined for certain, as no post-mortem was permitted due to the risk of potential infection. On the 6th of September, Professor Bedson committed suicide, leaving the following note. I am sorry to have misplaced the trust which so many of my friends and colleagues have placed in me and my work. At 3.50pm on the 11th of September, 1978, Janet Parker died. She was 40 years old. She was the last recorded death in the world from smallpox. Contact tracing and immunisation totaled more than 500 people by just the 28th of August, only two weeks after Mrs Parker had first shown symptoms. 328 people that had direct contact were placed into quarantine. This included 35 nurses, 10 doctors, as well as porters, engineers and garbage collectors. In the end, 1,820 contacts in the East Birmingham Hospital were vaccinated. More than 1,000 of those were hospital staff. An additional 1,602 people were vaccinated at a central vaccination clinic in Congreve Passage. No one was taking any chances. Fortunately, after an agonising wait and careful monitoring, no one else came down with smallpox and the world sighed in relief that another outbreak had been avoided. So what is variola, major and minor, commonly referred to as smallpox? And there are major and minor variants, and each has multiple strains of differing lethality. But we're not going to explore every one of them here. The origin of the disease is not actually known specifically, though there is evidence it existed during the Egyptian Empire in the 3rd century before the Common Era, or BCE. It had an average incubation period of 12 days and had a 30% mortality rate of those infected on average, with some epidemics reaching 40% mortality at their worst. In 1796, Dr. Edward Jenner observed that milkmaids who had contracted cowpox did not show any symptoms of smallpox. Dr. Jenner took material from a cowpox sore on a milkmaid's hand and inoculated it into a child's arm. 
In following months, Dr. Jenner exposed the same child a number of times to a variola virus, but the child never developed smallpox. Following more experiments in 1801, Dr. Jenner published his treatise on the origin of the vaccine inoculation. Dr. Jenner expressed his hope of inoculation that, and I quote, the annihilation of the smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human species, must be the final result of this practice, end quote. After isolated efforts to limit the spread of outbreaks of smallpox failed, the World Health Organization initiated a plan in 1959 to attempt to eradicate smallpox from the world. Unfortunately, this attempt did not have sufficient funding, personnel, and buy-in from enough countries, and also lacked sufficient vaccines donated to succeed. By 1966, regular outbreaks were still occurring on multiple continents, although it had been eliminated in the 1950s from most parts of the Americas. In 1967, the WHO intensified the eradication program and contributed 2.4 million US dollars each year at the time to the effort. Vaccines initially were produced by the United States of America and Russia. However, by 1973, the vaccines were predominantly produced in the developing countries they were being used in. In the period between 1958 and 1979, the USSR had provided 1.5 billion doses to the effort. In the 20th century alone, smallpox killed an estimated 300 million people around the world before it was eradicated from public transmission. Interestingly, finding an accurate estimate of the r naught of smallpox is surprisingly difficult given how long the virus has existed and how many people lost their lives to it. r naught is the measure of how many other people are likely to be infected by one person in an unprotected population. An excellent article by the CDC delves into the historical data that's available and concludes that the r naught is just less than 2. By comparison, one of the highest r noughts is measles, which is between 12 and 18. For influenza, is between 0.9 and 1.6. A more recent or current example, that of SARS-CoV-2, is between 2 and 5.7, although this figure is being refined as our knowledge increases. This episode is brought to you by Many Tricks, makers of helpful apps for the Mac, whose apps do, you guessed it, many tricks. Their apps include Butler, Keymail, Leech, Desktop Curtain, TimeSync, Moom, Name Mangler, Resolutionator, Witch, and the return of Usher with Usher 2. There's so much to talk about for each app they make, so we're going to touch on some highlights for six of them, starting with Usher 2, the return of the classic Usher. But now it's a full 64-bit app that works well with Catalina and the Mac OS 11 Big Sur. So what is Usher? It's an amazing, powerful media management and playback app that can see movies you have in TV, music, or photos apps, or any library location that you'd prefer on your Mac. It can organize them for you. If you like, you can create advanced playlists and sorting criteria, and you can even edit their information all from within Usher. Not only that, to celebrate the return of Usher, you can grab the Usher 2 beta from the link in the show notes, and there's a special pre-sale for it as well. Check it out. Time Sync. Track the time you spend in apps or activities on your Mac the simple and easy way with Time Sync. You can pool your apps by common activities, create custom trackers for non-Mac activities, and its simple but powerful reporting feature shows you exactly where your time went so you can plan better and stay focused. Resolutionator is so simple. A drop-down menu from the menu bar, and you can change the resolution of whatever display you like that's currently connected to your Mac. The best part, though, you can even set your resolution to fit more pixels than are actually there. It's very handy when you're stuck on your laptop and you need a bit more screen real estate. Which... You should think about which as a supercharger for your command tab app switcher. If you've got three or four documents open at once in any one app, then which's beautifully simple pop-up quickly lets you pick exactly the one you're looking for. You can switch between tabs as well as apps and app windows with horizontal, vertical, or menu bar switching panels. With text search for switching, you can show the frontmost app in the menu bar icon with full touch bar support and much, much more. Name Mangler. You've got a whole bunch of files to rename quickly, efficiently, and in large numbers, then Name Mangler can help. It's designed for staged renaming sequences with powerful rejects pattern matching. Recent additions include a group by feature when making a sequence and title case conversions can now keep their existing formatting or convert them to lower case based on word length. The best part is it shows you the results you go. And if you mess anything up, just revert back to where you started and try again. 
Moom makes it easy to move any of your windows to whatever screen positions you want. Halves, corners, edges, fractions of the screen. And then you can even save and recall your favorite window arrangements with a special auto arrange feature when you connect or disconnect an external display. It has full touch bar support and keyboard integration with Adobe's apps and it also works perfectly on an iPad operating in sidecar mode and it even has a sharper hexagon look in Big Sur. It's the first app I load on a new Mac because it's just awesome. Now that's just six of their great apps and that's only half of them and they all work with the latest version of macOS Big Sur. All of these apps have free trials that you can download from manytricks or one word, dot com slash pragmatic and you can easily try them out before you buy them. They're all available from their website or through the Mac App Store. However, if you visit that URL, you can take advantage of a special discount off their very helpful apps exclusively for engineered network listeners. Simply use engineer25, that's engineer, the word, and 25, the numbers, in the discount code box in the shopping cart and you'll receive 25% off. This offer is only available to engineered network listeners for a limited time, so take advantage of it while you can. Thank you to Manytricks for sponsoring the engineered network. So let's talk about the investigation into the incident. Professor Reginald Arthur Shooter was appointed to lead an investigation and provide a report into the incident on the 30th of August 1978. The report has since been referred to simply as the Shooter Report and weighs in at 236 pages in length, with some of its findings held to be controversial. Members of the investigating team came from the Dangerous Pathogens Advisory Group, that's DPAG, experts from the World Health Organization, the Health and Safety Executive and Trades Union Congress. There were five vectors that they considered, and I quote, Firstly, the smallpox laboratory, the virus reaching Mrs. Parker through the air or by human contact or by contact with contaminated material or equipment. Second, a person suffering from smallpox or a form of smallpox modified by previous vaccination. Third, an animal infected with an animal pox virus in the Department of Anatomy's primate colony. Fourth, Virus that has survived in Mrs. Parker's studio and darkroom since 1966 when a photographer who was working there developed smallpox. And fifth, virus deliberately or accidentally removed from the smallpox laboratory. End quote. The investigators were unable to determine with complete certainty which of the above was the pathway for Janet Parker's infection, hence some controversy. However, they did eliminate some of them. Their conclusions were that there were three possible and likely methods of transmission. First of all, surface deposition and transfer. At least one member of the microbiology department frequently visited the outer animal pox room and was found to have visited Janet Parker at least once, possibly more times during the infection period. Hence, it is possible this individual picked up the virus on their hands or clothes between the two locations. Secondly, airborne transmission to the telephone room. The distance from the outer animal pox room to the telephone room via duct C was only 8 feet, or 2.5 metres. The normal seating position in the telephone room was directly adjacent to duct C. In the smallpox room, a poorly fitted inspection panel was identified on duct C, and this option was considered highly likely because Mrs Parker made almost exclusive use of the telephone room several times every day. You have to keep in mind... This was the 1970s. Telephones weren't in every room and there were no mobile phones. Airborne transmission to the corridor was considered highly unlikely, though not impossible. The investigators found using traces, testing showed that those traces liberated outside of the smallpox safety cabinet in the smallpox room were able to reach the main corridor outside the pox virus laboratory suite. Anyone visiting the inquiry office or the dark room could have been exposed this was considered highly unlikely as multiple other unvaccinated people visited the inquiry office and whilst Mrs Parker was one of the few that spent more time in the dark room, if this was the more likely option, then other infections still would have manifest. But they didn't. Overall, under normal working conditions, airborne spread of the smallpox virus is unlikely if the handling procedures are employed effectively. However, the investigators noted that in this case, the handling methods were, and I quote, far from ideal. So let's talk a little bit about DPAG. That's the Dangerous Pathogens Advisory Group. 
They were formed in November of 1975, following the 1973 London smallpox incident, and they formed a working party called the Working Party on the Laboratory Use of Dangerous Pathogens under Sir George Godber, the chief medical officer at the time. The group was simply called the Godber Working Party, and they provided recommendations and updated a code of practice for laboratories handling the most dangerous organisms, so-called Category A pathogens. The group focused on advising laboratories on their suitability for working with such pathogens and on precautions that should be taken, and, in this capacity, came to review the Birmingham Smallpox Laboratory, inspecting it on the 4th of February 1976 and ultimately approving it in August of 1976. Yeah, that's when I was born. Their findings showed the laboratory complied with all but one of the requirements from the Interim Code of Practice from the Cox Committee, the exception being to vaccinate all of those in the building where the laboratory was situated against smallpox. The newly written Godba Working Party recommendations went significantly further and included airlocks, showers, changing facilities, and double-ended autoclave for sterilisation of materials. Today, these sorts of precautions are considered to be minimum standards in most parts of the world, but back then, these were quite strict requirements that would have required significant investment in order for the lab to qualify. Not only that, the Interim Code of Practice had a section on protection by vaccination, and it reads as follows, and I quote, 1. All new members of the staff of the laboratory to be vaccinated as a condition of their employment at intervals not greater than two years thereafter. Two. Regular vaccination and revaccination also to be done on the cleaners, maintenance staff, service engineers, window cleaners, relevant groups of students, and any others needing frequent access to the department. Three, regular vaccination and revaccination to be offered, with reasons, to members of departments in the same building. Four, regular vaccination and revaccination to be offered to families of staff. Five, one person to be responsible for arranging vaccinations and keeping records, and six, all vaccinations and revaccinations to be inspected subsequently and repeated if no major reaction is observed. End quote. So given the gaps above at the Birmingham Laboratory, why approve the lab to handle those pathogens? Clearly, there were some significant gaps. The reasons that were cited by Dr. R. J. Henderson, he was the DPAG inspector in 1976 in his report, uh, noting in this report Professor Bedson at the time was still referred to as Dr. Bedson in his role at the time. And I quote, I think smallpox work could be allowed to continue in view of the following. 1. Dr. Bedson, who would normally undertake the work, is a virologist of considerable repute, both here and abroad, for smallpox diagnostic work and work on pox viruses. He is very experienced and seems a very conscientious worker. Doctors Skinner and George, who were taught by Dr. Bedson, are also knowledgeable and experienced. All three fully understand the danger of the virus escaping. 2. The vaccination program is most thorough and is personally supervised by Dr. Bedson. Students coming to the virus laboratory for instruction are vaccinated on the first day of attendance by Dr. Bedson. This forms part of their instruction and no one appears to be missed. 3. The smallpox diagnostic work is never delegated, but carried out by one of the three doctors. 4. The drill for no allowing escape of the virus is thorough and more than makes up for the lack of shower and changing facilities. 5. The laboratory serves a large and important area in which a very large number of immigrants with a continual flow to and from tropical and subtropical parts of the world. End quote. What strikes me with that assessment is there's a lot of professional respect, which is fine, but there's not a lot of procedural diligence. They noted in a rider to that recommendation stating, and I quote, fresh clearance should be sought in the event of significant changes in staff, facilities, or work program, end quote. Now, if it was me, I'd be asking to cite the vaccination records, cross-reference by role and work location, provide evidence of restriction of vaccinated personnel only being permitted into the laboratory in alignment with the code of practice. Of note, there were some records, according to the Vaccination Practices Questionnaire, attached to a letter from Professor Bedson on the 31st of March, 1978, to Dr. I. Arita, the Chief Smallpox Eradication Unit of the World Health Organization based in Geneva. 
In that letter, Professor Betson stated his own concerns, and I quote, I hope that it is clearly understood that while we are satisfied that what we are doing is sensible and secure and has been approved by our own national bodies, our facilities in no way match those set out for the definitive smallpox labs. It would be expensive and very costly in time if we were to try and establish such a laboratory and quite unjustified in view of our projected halt to the smallpox whitepox work at the end of the year. End quote. Back to the attachments for a second. It clearly states that, and I'll quote again, those working in the lab are revaccinated each year. All others in the department, including special cleaners, are revaccinated at two year intervals. The university maintenance staff, security staff, medical school porters, and service engineers of outside contractors are likewise revaccinated at two year intervals. End quote. You know what I didn't see in that list? I didn't see medical photographers that work in the building. And that's not in the list. And then they were only trying to cover off on those working directly in the lab, either for medical reasons, cleaning, or equipment servicing, not people that may work in adjacent rooms. The records of vaccinations were kept in the Department of Microbiology, and many staff that worked in the building regularly just weren't vaccinated. Simply put, they didn't go far enough, as required by the Interim Code of Practice, with respect to vaccination of personnel. Let's talk a little bit about procedures, though. Now, I've learned not to trust people, although that's possibly my untrusting nature, but experience has demonstrated to me time and again the inescapable truth that we are all human, and we all have lapses of concentration, no matter how experienced or conscientious we are or that others think that we are. People rationalise away gaps that exist between rules, um, regulations, and reality. Rules, Regulations, and Rationalized Realities. i make a good article title someday. Anyway, there are references in Dr. Henderson's recommendation letter to exhaust fans running for a set period of 15 minutes after work in the cabinet is over, but there are no mentions about whether this is a set timer or a procedure. If it's automated with a timer, what are, where are its test records to ensure it's operating properly? During the inspection, they tested the negative pressure generated in the cabinet using an anemometer, and it passed. However, no other tests of any other equipment were performed in the inspection. During the inspection, they also didn't examine any of the ducting, and hence they didn't notice the inspection panel that covered the service duct in the corner of the lab. During the investigation, it was determined that for some of the procedures in testing smallpox, it was necessary to pass in and out of the smallpox room to place cultures in the incubators and a low-speed centrifuge. That's a fact that wasn't discussed, and nor was it shared, during the original inspection. So let's talk about a change of role. Because in August 1976, Professor Bedson was appointed to the chair of medical microbiology and was drawn away from the smallpox lab work and more into administration and teaching. Effectively, a promotion of sorts. And to allow this, he delegated control of the experimentation to one of his PhD students. During the investigation in an interview with that student, who admitted that since she had begun work on the smallpox viruses in the room, she was on no occasion supervised by Professor Bedson. As suggested in the letter previously referenced, there was a drive to cease all smallpox-related work by the end of 1978. Now, this led to a higher demand for testing of different smallpox strains in that lab, which required greater quantities of the virus, a total of 22 variants of variola major, in fact. These were transferred to Birmingham from the St Mary's Hospital Medical School Smallpox Laboratory. However, no notification was provided to DPAG, which was part of their requirements. During the early part of 1978, unsafe work practices began to emerge in the laboratory in Birmingham, including failure to use the safety cabinet for all open work with smallpox, handling equipment outside of the smallpox room with unwashed and undisinfected gloves, an increase in the amount of traffic in and out of the smallpox room to aid in the production of volumes required for additional testing. As part of this accelerated workload, work was done on the Abid strain of variola on July the 24th and 25th of 1978. It was this strain that infected Janet Parker. At no time was DPAG made aware of the changes to personnel, the delegation, despite their rider requiring that they do so. I'd like to take a moment to talk for our, one of our sponsors for this episode, and that's Solva. Solva is a calculation app by Aqualia for the Mac. Now, I'm careful to call Solva a calculation app 
because it's more than just a calculator. It's much quicker and easier to use in the spreadsheet. Just start typing away and in real time, the answers just show up in the right hand column. Let's say you want to figure out 10% of 200. Just type that exactly and there's your answer. Converting currencies, 10 euro plus 10 USD in AUD, done. I use it all the time for that. Crazy things like you want to know how many minutes you've been alive? Try 44 years, 16 weeks and 4 days as minutes and it turns out I've been alive 23,309,000 minutes. Yay. Eh, that's old. It's my go-to app when I'm converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit. 120F in C, done. A recently added neat feature, at the end of any line, you want to show the decimal as the nearest whole fraction. Just add the text as fraction and boom, Solver converts it for you. It's amazing. New in Solver 3 for the Mac, there's time and date calculations like 30th August 2020 to today in weeks, in days, in hours, whatever you like. And Solver also supports time zone aware date and time calculations and conversions as well. You can link different result lines together easily to create more complicated calculations with subtotals along the way. It now comes with full dark mode support and it looks amazing. If you have a touch bar on your Mac, it supports that too. Full integration with Spotlight Search, with Automator, Solver has now got a command line tool and integrates beautifully with Alfred. It has an integrated sheet management system and you can easily share your working and your results. The list of great features just goes on and on. And now with language support also, including English, German, Russian, and Chinese. If you're not convinced, then go to the URL in the show notes and check out the Mac version, which has a 30 day free trial. I've been using Solver for many, many years and I use it every single day. I always use it when I'm preparing notes for causality. Solver for Mac is available from the website solver.app as well as from the Mac App Store. If you use the URL in the show notes, it helps out the show, so please use that URL in the show notes to learn more about this amazing app. Visit solver.app and check it out today. Thank you to Aqualia with their amazing app Solver for once again sponsoring the Engineered Network. During 1978, a WHO inspection was undertaken which found some of the improper practices taking place and made further recommendations. Prohibitive mouth pipetting in the lab, use of back fastening gowns which remain in the laboratory, the use of hyperchlorite as a permanent barrier in all sinks, and more. In his response, Professor Bedson rebutted their points, although he did admit, and I quote, reservations about our physical facilities were of course expected, end quote and also stated that, and I quote, the risks must be minimal, end quote. The final correspondence from Professor Bedson on the subject stated that there was no question of his being able to upgrade his laboratory to meet WHO standards, and he was therefore proceeding with his plan to complete his studies with variola viruses by the end of the year. In short, they were never going to upgrade the lab, and the work was about to end in several months' time. The sad part of this incident is that there were previous incidents that led up to it. Disturbingly, it wasn't the first time that loss of containment occurred relating specifically to smallpox in the UK. In May 1966, a photographer also working in the same lab in Birmingham, Tony McLennan, also contracted smallpox. His infection was mild and non-fatal, and the investigation at the time had many other possible sources of infection, such that it was not definitively identified as having come from the laboratory. In 1973, an outbreak came from a loss of containment from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This subsequently led to the drafting of the Interim Code of Practice and the formation of DPAG to prevent exactly this from happening. And that's just smallpox, and that's just in the UK. For other pathogens, historically, there are, unfortunately, many more examples. Ultimately, what do we learn from all of this? Well, there's three things that I'd like to focus on. Firstly, Professor Bedson's choices. Having read through this and different accounts, there is no doubt in my mind that Professor Bedson was a talented and conscientious man who was racked with guilt over the outcome, so much so he took his own life. The thing is, that's an outcome that could have been avoided. It's clear that Professor Bedson was heavily emotionally invested in smallpox work, and he wanted it to continue, but he resisted the costs of upgrading the smallpox lab 
to meet the interim code requirements. In the report, it's not clear why, whether that funding wasn't made available from the university or if a grant was withheld or if doing so would have meant losing the chance to keep working with smallpox in Birmingham due to the time delays. But ultimately, whatever the reason, the point is actually, if it can't be done safely, then should it be done at all in that laboratory? There's enough evidence to suggest that Professor Bedson was also accustomed to working with dangerous pathogens and that he didn't fully see the need for these additional precautions. The investigators concluded in point 170 of the report, and I quote, if the Birmingham laboratory had had the facilities, primarily the provision of an airlock, a shower, changing facilities, and double-ended autoclave, the facilities would have made it considerably more difficult to develop the bad practices that led to the escape of smallpox virus, end quote. Even if we assume Professor Bedson was infallible, the truth is he took a different job focus. He delegated supervision of the lab to someone without providing adequate training, and ultimately those habits were not transferred to the other staff working in the lab. Those were his choices, and they were not the right ones to make in this case. Proceduralizing the handling to the fullest extent possible, training the new people properly, and installing the recommended safety equipment to reinforce those procedures. That's how you minimize critical risks. You don't minimize critical risks through trust alone. Let's talk about the inspection. One interesting overlap with this incident and the 737 MAX is that the inspectors needed to witness an employee actually calibrating the vein to know that their procedure was not correctly developed and followed. The inspection of the facility in 1976 was done on a day when there was no viral handling taking place. So how could they demonstrate any kind of compliance? In engineering, we call that a desktop analysis, meaning you read the documents, check some records, that's about it. I mean, okay, they got the anemometer out and they checked one chamber, that's about all they did that was a practical test. For something basic and with a low risk outcome, there's probably a good trade-off, a cost trade-off there that's okay, but honestly, it's about as useful as kicking a car tire looking for a puncture. Sure, you'll get some sore toes out of it and it might seem like a good idea and useful thing to do, but it really isn't all that good at finding problems. People plus processes prevents problems. Look at the process, yes, but you have to look at how the process is applied by people in the real environment. Otherwise, you only have part of the puzzle and your conclusions will be wrong. And for something as critical as this, the inspection simply wasn't thorough enough. When the WHO inspected in mid-1978, they did witness bad work practices, but still didn't find the poorly fitted inspection panel. And finally, training. How often does this come up? There is no doubt that the personnel working in the laboratory were technically competent. However, they didn't appear to have been trained well enough to understand the risks or reasons behind the procedures for working safely with dangerous pathogens. Beyond training, there's also the risk of inexperienced personnel working alone in high-risk activities. Working unaccompanied or unsupervised on a high-risk activity means that there is no one to cross-check, confirm, validate, or challenge an unsafe work practice, which is highly likely for lesser experienced personnel that haven't learned all the ways that things can go wrong. Whilst it's not the only answer, it's a good layer of protection against mistakes being made. Cutting corners and poor practices in general would be caught by a supervisor, provided the person that you're with has more experience than the one that they're supervising. It may surprise some people to learn that smallpox is not technically eradicated. We're still keeping some of it. Why keep it at all? There's an interesting little story to this one. The WHO declared smallpox was eradicated on the 8th of May 1980 after a global effort that took 14 years to complete and it remains one of the most impressive achievements of medical science to date. Despite its eradication in the wild, there have been a small number of laboratories in the world permitted to keep samples of the virus. In 1984, there were only two. The State Research Centre of Virology and Biotechnology in Koltsevo, Russia, and 
the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in the United States of America. Both facilities have BSL-4, that's Biosafety Level 4 capability, which is the highest accredited level of biosecurity for storage of dangerous pathogens. Since then, the WHO recommended complete destruction of smallpox samples in 1986, with a deadline of the end of 1993. This was then postponed until the end of June 1999 and then again to June of 2002. In 2002, the World Health Assembly agreed to permit temporary retention of the smallpox virus for specific research purposes. Some medical scientists suggest that keeping smallpox could provide insights into developing new vaccines and antivirals and they should therefore be kept indefinitely. In 2010, a WHO-appointed team also recommended destroying the virus stocks in the labs. Interestingly, in an op-ed piece in 2011, Kathleen Sebelius, the secretary for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, suggested keeping the virus samples to ensure future generations are at lesser risk should smallpox re-emerge. She pointed out that the genome of the virus is now fully documented and it is possible with enough knowledge and equipment to artificially recreate smallpox without the viral samples. Another argument is that smallpox samples still exist beyond the two BSL-4 labs and this is validated by relatively recent evidence. In 2013, cloned smallpox DNA fragments were discovered in a lab in South Africa. In 2014, at the National Institutes of Health, that's the NIH, uh, Bethesda campus, vials labelled variola were discovered in an unused portion of a storage room in a US Food and Drug Administration FDA lab on campus, which were later confirmed to be viable samples of smallpox that dated from the 1950s. Both of the above were witnessed being destroyed by a WHO representative. For that reason, it's very likely there are more samples elsewhere in the world whose whereabouts are as of yet unknown. In the end, working with dangerous pathogens can be done safely. And collectively, we have decades of experience and have developed tools and equipment that make it far more difficult to make a mistake. But ultimately, it still comes down to people, human factors. The safest procedure followed, using untested, faulty equipment, pathogens can get out. The best tested equipment, but used improperly, pathogens can get out. The best procedure that's followed, the best equipment available, but inexperienced personnel, pathogens might get out if they make a rookie mistake. In the end, we need all of these layers of protection, and that's what they are. They're layers of protection designed to protect ourselves and those around us. We need to test our equipment ventilation systems, have independent audits regularly to make sure the equipment is functioning correctly to keep us safe. Some people hate audits. Audits are good. We want audits, independent audits that we can trust the results so that we can fix the problems that they find, ones that we've overlooked, we've become blind to. We need to develop procedures for handling pathogens and be trained and retrained regularly to ensure we follow them correctly. We need to ensure new people brought in are properly trained and supervised as well. In Birmingham, trust was misplaced. On the cusp of exterminating smallpox in the wild and bad work practices let a pathogen out, claiming two lives. The virus killed Janet Parker, but in a way, it also killed Professor Bedson indirectly. One of the things I think about sometimes when I'm asked to review or approve anything that could have a critical outcome is, what's the worst thing that could happen? If I'm not satisfied that every precaution has been taken and the right people haven't reviewed it as well as me, then I won't authorise it. If I make a mistake and someone dies because of it, I don't want to end up like Professor Benson. Clearly, it's something he felt deeply responsible for, so much so he couldn't live with it. No one wants to be in that position, no one. So don't let yourself get into that position. If it's not safe, if you have concerns, stop the job, stop working on it. Because sometimes those risks just aren't worth it. I'd personally like to thank Solver via Qualia for sponsoring the Engineered Network. You've tried a calculator and a spreadsheet, but if you haven't tried Solver yet, then you're missing out on a great app that fits perfectly with the way your brain actually thinks. 
Solver 3 for Mac is available from the solver.app website as well as through the Mac App Store. If you use the URL in the show notes, it helps out the show, so please use the URL in the show notes to learn more about this amazing app. Check it out today. I'd also like to thank Manytrix for once again sponsoring the Engineered Network. If you're looking for some Mac software that can do many tricks, remember to specifically visit this URL, manytricks, all one word, dot com slash pragmatic, for more information about their amazingly useful apps. If you're enjoying Causality and want to support the show, you can by supporting our sponsors or by becoming a patron. You can find details at engineered.network slash causality about how you can help this show to continue to be made. A big thank you to all of our patrons. A special thank you to our silver producers, Mitch Bielger, John Whitlow, Kevin Kosh, Oliver Steele, Leslie, Law Chan, Hafthor, and Shane O'Neill. And an extra special thank you to our gold producer, known only as R. Causality is heavily researched and links to all materials used for the creation of this episode are contained in the show notes. You can find them in the text of the episode description on your podcast player or on our website. You can follow me on the Fediverse at Chigi at engineered.space, on Twitter at John Chigi, all one word, or the network at engineered underscore net. This was Causality. I'm John Chigi. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>